film Otter 501, we follow the life of a stranded baby sea otter. For over 25 years, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Sea Otter Research and Conservation Program has been rescuing sick, abandoned, and stranded baby sea otters just like her. This is the story of one of those otters, and the scientists who once knew her very well. To begin the story at the beginning, I got a phone call on a Monday morning that an otter had just been found dead um, in an area right around the middle of Monterey Bay, and it was a big adult female, um, and that it was coming in for us to examine. Dr. Melissa Miller is a wildlife pathologist who studies otter mortality. She sees a lot of dead otters in her lab, but this one had a unique characteristic. She had some holes in her back flippers, and what that tells the biologist right away is that this is an animal that probably we knew before because the way otters are marked so that biologists and scientists can track them, they'll have little piercings on their back feet and in those uh, the biologists will put in little plastic tags so that they can see them from a distance and identify them. When we started the necropsy and started to peel the skin back, we found a pellet gun pellet that was embedded in the, just under the skin. So we stopped, came down, did full body x-rays or radiographs, and what we're able to determine from those radiographs is that she only had the one, it was in an area where it wouldn't have caused any real damage. And based on the fact that it was encased in scar tissue that had been there for many, many years and, and was uh, totally incidental to her cause of death. And then the other thing you can see in the radiograph right here is this is a, a tracking transmitter that this animal had. So what we know from looking at this radiograph is that this is an animal that is, has been uh, followed for some time. The other part of this that um, allows us to try and go back and figure out who she is is you see this little linear shadow right here. This is what's called a, a, a pit tag or a passive integrated transponder. And we have special scanners. This is just like what you do for your dog or your cat, where you can go in and scan this and it'll give her an individual number. We can go back and look at that and figure out who this, this otter is. And much to our surprise, we have a pretty extensive history of um, the whole list of otters that have been handled in the past. And she wasn't on that list. So we called back over to the aquarium and they have a more extensive list and, and a really long history and they were able to track this down to an otter that actually has a name and her name was Harmony. Harmony had been one of the first otter pups successfully raised and released by the Monterey Bay Aquarium's sea otter research and conservation team. Michelle Stedler is a sea otter field biologist and one of the pioneers of the SORAC program. Back in 1997, she was one of the first to meet Harmony. When Harmony came into the aquarium, it was pretty exciting because I was working in the rehab office and she was brought in by a gentleman working on a construction site in Carmel. He knocked on our door and I answered the door and there he was standing with this little pup in his arms. Oh, no. And she was about uh, five weeks old when, we, when he brought oh, her in. So um, we took her in, of course, and immediately started the care that we used to do back then, which is completely different than what you see now. It's a lot of hands-on. We were holding them, we didn't have the costumes, and she was put in a tank with another otter named Ivy. And Ivy was 12 weeks old, so Ivy became like, in my mind anyway, became her big sister. And so when Harmony was brought in, she was given a name. A lot of the pups that came in during the early, not quite all the 90s, were given names. We actually chose names from Steinbeck stories. And that's how she came, she came about with that name. So, and it seemed to fit her very well. She was very easygoing. She kind of lived in harmony with all the other pups that she was with, and she was not a difficult pup to take care of. After being raised at the aquarium, Harmony was tagged and released into the wild in Elkhorn Slough, where researchers continued to monitor her. So Harmony had flipper tags and a radio transmitter, mm -hmm. and you were able to get a lot of information about her when she was first released, when what, she was what first kind of things did you learn about her? Um, we learned ab about who she interacted with. We learned that when she fed on the clams in the sh shallow spots, she didn't actually take the clams up. She would go around and bite the siphons off and leave the clams there. And she learned to eat a lot of the little crabs in there when she was younger. So for a youngster, 
that was and that was raised in a tank. This was a good place for her to start because you know the food was like right there in her face. It was kind of almost like being in a tank. I heard that she had a number of pups. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell me about those pups? Yeah, we can tell you about the first one she had was in November of '99, and it was a little male pup, and that was exciting because she was the first otter that we you know hand raised and released to the wild. She was the first one to give birth to a pup. So I think when we saw her with this pup, there was two or three of us standing on the banks of Elkhorn Slough in the, um, by the water, and we're jumping up and down in the pickleweed, just totally excited. It's like, oh my God, she's got a pup, oh, she's got a great. pup, that's so cool. Wow. And so then we watched her every day, making sure that he was doing okay, making sure she was okay. And um, she did a really great job of raising him. Over the years, she had flipper tags. Her radio that she had, the transmitted radio, stopped working. So we were only able to identify her visually with her flipper tags. And then eventually those came off. We figured over time, she, we kind of saw three pups over time that we suspected it was her and suspected she had these pups, but we never watched those other ones mm. grow because once she lost the tag in the radio, it was hard to keep track of her. But we'd always see this little gray otter swim by and like, I know you, I bet you're Harmony. <laughs> the researchers lost track of Harmony in 2005. From that point on, she was lost to science. Seven years later, she'd be found again and brought into Dr. Miller's lab. Part of my role is to pick up the story of Harmony where the last sighting of her left off and to do my very best to tell them not only how she died, but also as much as possible as I can about how she lived. And so to do that, the first step is to examine her all over externally and see what we can learn that might tell us about what was going on in her life. And one of the first things that we noticed is she had a big healing wound on her nose. And for a sea otter, an adult female sea otter, what that means is I'm still breeding, which in itself is impressive for a 15-year-old otter. Uh, when the males are breeding the females, they'll actually grab them by the end of the nose during the mating process, and it often causes little wounds that normally heal up. Then the next step is to actually um, look internally and see if we can find clues about um, the rest of Harmony's story. We're able to look at her reproductive tract, her uterus and her ovaries, and what's really interesting is that you can actually tell from looking at those how many pups an otter has had during its time. Each time an otter actually um, has an egg that comes off the surface of the ovary uh, for the next pup, it actually will develop into a scar on the ovary. So we could actually count those out in her case, and she had 10 scars. And what that means is over her lifetime, this animal actually had 10 sea otter pups, which is um, maybe one of the highest I've ever seen for an adult female otter. As we uh, went through the entire examination, we were able to determine that the cause of death in her case was that she had developed a very serious bacterial infection, had fought it for quite a period of time, but eventually uh, succumbed to that infection. So I see plenty of sad stories um, that come across the table, but the nice thing about this particular story with her is that she was an animal that lived to a ripe old age and uh, was extremely successful over her lifespan with producing a much higher than average number of pups and seemed to live a full life. And we were happy to be able to get that information back to the people at the aquarium that had worked so hard um, in the first place for her. Looking back on Harmony, is, it's really exciting for us to see that this animal that we helped um, raise actually went out in the wild and had so many pups of her own and interacted in, in most cases was a normal you know otter that integrated back into the population you know and we were like yes she made it and it was a really good moment for all of us to know that this otter you know was a success story for us and it felt really good but she's a special otter she's pretty cool she was I have to say of all the otters that I worked with in rehab um, she was my favorite Harmony's story gives me hope for Little Otter 501. She's out there now, finding her way. And maybe in 15 years, we'll find out that she's had 10 pups and has lived to a ripe old age. Harmony's story is also a testament to the extraordinary work that people have undertaken to give sea otters a second chance at life in the wild. It goes to show, none of us can make it alone. <laughs>